Judges chapter 6. Turn there, please. Judges 6. Uh, this is going to be a, a hopefully an encouraging message to all those that are born again, to all those that are saved. And if you're listening to me, if you're sitting here today or you are listening to me and you are not saved, I will tell you, God, Jesus said, Behold, I make all things new. And one of the things that He's done with me is that He has given me new life. He has given me a new, a new purpose, a new heart, a new mind. I'm very satisfied in that. And uh, when you have run through what sin has to offer, and you figure it out, just like everybody else has, that it left you destitute, it left you very empty, it left you barren, left you in a wasteland, You'll find, the Bible says, taste and see that the Lord is good. You'll find that God will give you brand new things in life. He'll give you a new life. He'll just give you a new attitude, a new heart. You'll have a joy in you that you've never had before because the burden of your sins has been taken away. In Judges chapter 6, we're doing a study on the life of Gideon. And I preached this before many years ago. And as I'm going through it again, I just, you know, you always see things you never saw before. And I saw this, and I'm going to put this in the message this morning. Judges chapter 6, verse 28. The Bible says, when the men of the city arose... Remember, last Sunday, Gideon, God told him to destroy his dad's image of Baal. Tear it up, break it in pieces, and then cut down the grove that, that his daddy had planted, had a image of Ashtaroth, the fertility goddess in it, told him to cut down that grove and take a bullock out of his dad's herd and sacrifice the bullock using the wood from the grove that he had cut down. And so he, uh, Gideon wanted to do it at night because he was afraid of getting caught while he was doing it, as probably I would be. Lord, I'll do it, just don't let anybody watch me do it, and you know. So that's where we're at right now. So the next morning is when this is taking place. When the men of the city arose early in the morning, behold, the altar of Baal was cast down, and the grove was cut down that was by it, and the second bullock was offered upon the altar that was built. And they said one to another, Who hath done this thing? And when they inquired and asked, they said, Gideon, the son of Joash, hath done this thing. I don't know how they found it out. I don't know how they figured it out. But they got it right. So now Gideon's in big trouble. The men of the city said unto Joash, Bring out thy son that he may die. Do not, people, misunderestimate the resolve of people who are worshiping a different God. The Bible teaches us that at some point, their hatred for the true God, who is Jesus Christ, their hatred for Him will be taken out on God's people. Now, we're living here in America. So far, we don't have the persecution that we read about in the Bible. So far, we don't see them dragging Christians out the middle of Main Street and, and uh, Mill Street here at the corner of Main and Mill and hanging them in public be simply because they're Bible-believing Christians. We don't see that. But it does take place in this world. Right now. Taking place. And my heart goes out to God's people everywhere who have to live in the face of danger knowing that at any day... A Muslim horde will come and drag them out of their house, rape their wife, uh, destroy their children, and let, let the men watch it before they're murdered and slain in the street. Muslims have gone to Bible-believing churches in Kenya and burnt the churches down while the people were in it. And I don't know the future, but what if such a thing began to happen in America? But they wanted, just for cutting down the altar of Baal and cutting down the grove, 
They were, going to, they were not going to take him to court and sue him. They were not asking for reparations. They said, this man has to die for this. Verse 30, because he had cast down the altar of Baal and because he had cut down the grove that was by it. Now I want you to listen to Joash. Joash is the one who built the altar and planted the grove. But here, here listen to the advice now of this lost man. Joash, verse 31, Joash said unto all that stood against him, Will you plead for Baal? Will, watch this now. Will you save him? Meaning Baal. And I want you to think about this. Their religion was so great and their God so powerful that they felt that they had to save their God instead of their God saving them. I tell you, we've got the right religion. Our God does not need us to pull Him out of the fire. Amen? Our God does not need us to save Him. There are people all over this world who curse our God. Our God does not need us to take out vengeance on them. Vengeance belongeth to who? God. Our God is the one who says to us, I'll take care of it. I don't, I don't need you to save me. I'm here to save you. They, we've got the right religion. Somebody say amen. So he said, will you plead for Baal? Will you save him? He that will plead for him, let him be put to death while it is yet morning. Watch this now. If he be a God, let him plead for himself because one hath cast down his altar. Well, I like this. I like it. If he's really a God, why can't he plead for himself? That's just like when they brought the Ark of the Covenant in before Dagon. Left it there overnight. When the priest of Dagon came in, Dagon, the, the image of Dagon had fallen down on its face before the Ark of the Lord. I'm telling you, every knee will bow and every tongue will confess. Amen? And the men, the priest of Dagon, had to lift Dagon back up. That's not my religion. In my religion, I'm the one who falls down before the ark of the Lord, and God is the one who picks me up. Somebody say amen. In the days when Elijah was facing off with the uh, prophets of Baal, he just put out a simple contest. You build your altar, I'll build my altar. You, I, we're going to let you go first. We'll, we'll put a bullock on there and then you can ask your God to send fire down from heaven and consume the sacrifice. And those men stood from morning until late in the afternoon trying to get their God. And Elijah was making fun of us. Is, is your God, is he out pursuing somewhere? Is he asleep? Where is your God? Elijah prayed one prayer and God came down in power. Somebody say amen. I'm telling you, we've got the right God and we've got the right religion. So verse 32, I want you to notice this. Therefore, on that day, he called him Jerub Baal. And here's what it means. Saying, let Baal plead against him. Because he has thrown down his altar. Father, I just ask you, Lord, to bless your word. And help me preach this morning. Help me, Lord, to say everything right. And Lord, Father, would you stand in my place and preach for me. To these people that have come here to listen. I pray that God should help us now in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, Amen. What this is showing us is, number one, they named him, Joash named him Jerob Baal. And it, what it literally means is, Baal has a, has a plead against him, or Baal is, is against him, or Baal is at enmity against Gideon. And what that was implying was, if Baal is really a god, then let him go after Gideon and let him kill Gideon and let him uh, do whatever he's got to do to Gideon for cutting down his altar and cutting down that grove. In other words, if Baal is really a god, then let Baal go against him. Now, we know that there be no gods except the one God who is God in heaven, whose son is Jesus Christ. Can I hear you say amen? But we know that there are devils everywhere. The Bible calls them gods with a little g. And we know then that every idol has a devil attached to it. So let's just say then that this altar rep represents the devil or a, a group of devils or whatever, but it represents the devil. 
And what happened here, Gideon now has a new name. And he is named after Baal, but he's not in praise and honor to Baal. It's a name that if they were to name this to me, I would wear it with honor. What it essentially means is, here is a man who Satan hates. Here is a man who Satan is after. Satan wants to kill him. Satan wants to destroy him. And this man is an enemy to the devil. I would like to have that name on me. Somebody say amen. I would like to know that I am an enemy of the devil and his kingdom. In everything that I do and in every place I go, I want to be an enemy to the devil. I hate him. I hate what he's done to me. I hate what he's done in my family. I hate what he's done to people in this church. I hate what he's done all over the world. I hate his God. Say amen. One of these days, I'm going to get to stand on the neck of the devil. The Bible says, may the God of heaven bruise Satan under your feet shortly. And I've been packing on a little weight just to make it hurt. Turn your Bibles to um, Acts chapter 19. Acts chapter 19. There's a story here. I like this story. It to me is funny. I'd like to, if I was a movie maker, I'd like to make a movie of this one. Men running naked. That's funny. If you know the story, it's funny. Acts chapter 19, verse 13. Then certain of the vagabond Jews, exorcists, took upon them to call over them which had evil spirits the name of the Lord Jesus. Now watch this. Now here are Jews, and they don't believe that Jesus is Lord. They don't believe it. But they've heard that in Jesus' name, devils are cast out. So they thought, you know, we'll try it. We'll try this. So, they had somebody that was possessed of devils. And they went to this person and they said, We adjure you by Jesus whom Paul preacheth. Now, notice that statement. There's nothing in this statement that's personal to them. In other words, they're not saying, In the name of Jesus, who I believe is King of kings and Lord of lords. There's nothing like that. It's Jesus whom Paul preacheth. Come out, we adjure you by Jesus whom Paul preacheth to come out. Verse 14, And there were seven sons of one Sceva, a Jew, and a chief of the priest, which did so. Seven men in this one place, exorcists, who are saying to a person possessed of the devil, We adjure you by Jesus whom Paul preacheth. I mean, they probably made it sound real Rough and I we come out, you know, how they do the theatrics, you know, and the charismatic stuff. Look, come out, Jesus. Make a big deal about it. Say it loud because devils have a hard time hearing. You got to say it real loud. Verse 15 And the evil spirit answered and said, Jesus, I know, and Paul, I know, but who are ye? And so, and the man in whom the evil spirit was leaped on them. And overcame them, seven men, jumped on them, overcame them, prevailed against them, so that they fled out of the house naked and wounded. Beat them up, ripped their clothes off of them to put them in shame. And these men running out, crying like little sissy snowflake girls, like liberal, college liberals, ah! running out naked. Beat up, bloodied, wounded by one man who had a devil. That devil was right. Jesus I know and Paul I know, but who are ye? And I want to ask you the question this morning, does the devil know who you are? I know, but we know who Jesus is and Paul was just a man. Paul was not anything special or extraordinary, but the devils knew Paul and they were afraid of him. But why were they afraid of Paul? They were afraid of Paul... I like this. I got I got to wait to give you the rest of it. But they were afraid of Paul because Paul believed God's word. And I want to tell you something, if you believe God's word, if you believe the Bible, if you are covered in the blood of Jesus and you are a saint of the most high God, 
The devils, I promise you, they know your name. They know your name. And I want to be somebody that the devil knows who I am and knows that I want to be a threat to everything that he's got in mind. Somebody say amen. I want the devil to know that if he comes after my family, he's going to have to deal with me, the apostle Paul, and Jesus. And he might have something on me, but he ain't got nothing on Jesus. Amen. Does the devil know who you are? Does the devil know? Now, back when you were in sin, of course the devil knew who you were. Didn't he? He had you on speed dial. Hey, let's go get drunk. I'm going to get drunk. Hey. There's a woman fixing to walk by your way. Look at her real good. Oh, look at that woman walking by. Every time the devil wanted you to sin, you sinned. He knew who you were. He had your name. But then, God did something for you. He gave you a new name. Do you know what that means? I went through the Bible and just looked at people who God gave them a new name. Jared, I was thinking of you going through this message. And you, I think you know what I'm going to say. In Judges chapter 6, Therefore on that day they called him Jared Baal, saying, Let Baal plead against him because he had thrown down his altar. He had, a, he had a new name. And what his new name meant was the devil knows who he is. Baal hates him. Baal's at war against him. And if I was Gideon, I would wear this name with pride. I am not on the devil's team. My jersey does not say Festus Devils. Amen? It's Bethel Saints. Amen. I already get his t-shirts made up. Bethel Saints. So everybody knows whose side we're on. Amen? Isaiah 62 2. Watch this. The Gentile. God had prophesied that the Gentiles would be saved. He said, The Gentiles shall see thy righteousness, and all kings thy glory, and thou shalt be called by a new name, which the mouth of the Lord shall name. My friends, when you give your life over to Jesus... We all, when we were in sin, our name might have been known because of our sin. In other words, when your name came up in a group of people, did it reference the sins that you commit? In other words, your name came up and they said, boy, he's the biggest drunk I know. Or your name came up and they said, he's a womanizer. Or your name came up and said, he hasn't said a clean word. January 2nd at 10 minutes 2 would be 31 years since he said a clean word. In other words, you were known back in the day by your sin and you took your name and you drug it through all the sin in your life and that's how you were known. When God saves you maybe the world does not understand this but when god saves you he gives you a new a name is an identity it is who we identify with and how we are identified and god gives you a new life a new purpose a new heart and a new name to go along with it that name comes out of it. the world may call you other names but I promise you, God's got a name for you that came out of his mouth. And one of these days, when you get to heaven, God's going to call you by that new name. And I guarantee you, you'll know it's you. How many mics are here this morning? Got two mics. How many Johns are here this morning? Got two Johns. 
Who else have we got that's got multiple names here? Got Melissa? How many Melissas we got? How many Lindas we got? Yeah. Hey, what I'm telling you is, I think we all got a different name in heaven that God has given to us personally, and He knows us by that new name. Somebody say amen. So when the world wants to look at you based upon what they know you used to be, you know that that is not who you are anymore. Amen. First person I thought of was Abram. Abram. When Abram was 90 years old and 9 and the Lord appeared to Abram. This is uh, Genesis chapter 17. I don't know why that's not up there on the screen, but turn to Genesis 17. By the way, 17, 17 is a number for transformation. That's what it means. It's a number that says he's changed or she has changed. They're different now than they used to be. They are not who they used to be anymore. Raise your hand. if you Thank by, by God's grace, you are not who you used to be anymore. Amen. You're not what you want to be, but you're not who you used to be. And if the world can't handle that, that's just too bad. Amen. When Abram, Abram was 90 years old and nine, the Lord appeared to Abram and said unto him, I am the almighty God, walk before me and be thou perfect. And I will make my covenant between me and thee, and will multiply thee exceedingly. And Abram fell on his face, and God talked with him, saying, As for me, behold, my covenant is with thee, and thou shalt be a father of many nations. Neither shall thy name any more be called Abram, but thy name shall be Abraham, for a father of many nations have I made thee. Now, something I want to draw your attention to. Five is the number for grace. But it's also the number associated with the rapture. Uh, Enoch was translated in Genesis 5. The Bible says, For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, with the trump of God, the dead in Christ shall rise first, then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together. So it represents the change that's going to take place to us when God blows a trumpet and we're changed out of here. We don't have this old body anymore. We got a new one. Somebody say amen. That's when we're going to get our new name. Now, the letter in Hebrew that they added to Abram's name was the letter He. And it's pronounced It has breath in it. H is what we call it, but it's the letter He. And in the Hebrew alphabet, you look in Psalm 119, you'll see this. It's the fifth letter. And God stuck the fifth letter in Abram's name and changed him, gave him breath. By the way, I look up on the screen. Abram, 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 Abram. He's called Abram four times. The fifth time his name, it's Abraham. Woo! Amen. Then look at this. God didn't just change Abram. He changed that. Now, here's what I'm going to say. Abram gave birth to Ishmael, who was a slave. Abraham gave birth to Isaac, who was a child of promise. God said unto Abraham, As for Sarai, thy wife, that thou shalt not call her name Sarai, but Sarah shall her name be. Again, God added, He added the breath. And Sarai, Sarai is mentioned 16 times. And the 17th time she's called in the Bible, it's Sarah. God's word's perfect. Amen. Before their new name, Ishmael was born of a servant. After their new name, Isaac was born of a promise. And I want to tell you something. When God changes your name, he makes you a child of promise. Somebody say amen. You'll be, listen, before you produce corruption in your life, now with a new name, you produce hope in somebody. With a new name, you can go to somebody that's lost and you can say, I, I know a man who can take away your, your sins. I know a man who can save you. I know a man who can put his spirit in you. I know a man that can give you everlasting life and you can birth an Isaac in them. Somebody say amen. That's what you can do with a new name. Well, I like this, don't you? 
Turn to Genesis. Hey, I like this, don't you? Good, because it might be past 12. Genesis 32. Jacob was left alone. Verse 24. Here's Jacob. Jacob was left alone, and there wrestled a man with him until the break. Who was that man? It was Jesus. I've wrestled with him. Things that I wanted, and I don't mean just lust wanted, I mean heart wanted. Things that I had to have from my heart, I wrestled with God over. Jacob was left alone, and there wrestled a man with him until the breaking of the day. And when he saw that he prevailed not against him, the man, Jesus, touched the hollow of Jacob's thigh, of his thigh, and the hollow of Jacob's thigh was out of joint as he wrestled with him. That's called cheating, as far as I'm concerned. You wrestle with somebody and you cripple them, but I guess that's part of it. And he said, the man, Jesus, said, let me go for the day breaketh. And he said, listen to this, you learn this, you learn this. Memorize this part of your Bible. I will not let thee go except thou bless me. You learn that. You've got something that you want. Something that means the world to you. Don't stop wrestling with God until He gives it to you. Amen. Those of you watching online, you know my testimony. I spent three days, 2008, I spent three days in my office wrestling with God, fasting and praying over what to do with this church. I had no idea. And everything that I came up with, I would write it down, and no sooner I'd get it written down, I'd say, well, that's stupid, and I'd cross it out. Write something else down. That's stupid. Cross it out. And finally, I just quit writing. I said, God, take over. But I'm not going to let you go until you bless me and bless this church. Nine years later, 10 million plus downloads, two gospel radio stations in Kenya, God blessed. God is blessed. Give the Lord a hand this morning. Okay? You learn this. When you get a new name, you'll wrestle with God. And you won't quit until He blesses you. And He said unto him, What is thy name? And he said, Jacob. And he said, Thy name shall be called no more Jacob, but Israel. Israel. For as a prince hast thou power with God and with men. That means... When you talk to God, God listens to you. You raise your hand if you have had people come to you and say, Will you pray for me? You, you know why? Because you're Israel and they know it. They know that you've got power with God. Now that's not who you used to be. Amen? They, nobody would come to you back in the day and say, Would you pray for me? Well, when you sober up, will you pray for me? No. But now they'll come to you and say, will you pray for me? They know that you are Israel. They know that you've got a new name. They know that you've got power with God. Somebody say amen. Woo! Boy, this is good. How about, turn to Genesis 41. Here's a name, here's a $20 name for you. Genesis 41. Let's have a little fun. Genesis 41, look in verse 45. And I'm going to pick you out and have you stand up and pronounce this name. Look at verse 45. Pharaoh called Joseph's name blank. Alicia. I see you laughing, Aaron. Stand up and say it. No? You work for me and you're telling me no? Ian? Yeah. Matthew? Listen, that's my son. I'm whipping you after church. I'm whipping you. Look at this. Verse 37. 
The thing was good in the eyes of Pharaoh because Joseph had interpreted the dreams in the eyes of all of his servants. And Pharaoh said unto his servants, Can we find such a one as this? A man in whom, watch this, in whom the Spirit of God is. Can we find such a man as this? In one, one in whom the Spirit of God is. And Pharaoh said unto Joseph, For as much as God has showed thee all this, there is none so discreet and wise as thou art. Thou shalt be over my house, and according to thy word shall all my people be ruled. Only in the throne will I be greater than thou. And Pharaoh said unto Joseph, See, I have set thee over all the land of Egypt. And Pharaoh took off his ring from his head. That's a big deal. Took his ring off his head put it, and put it on Joseph's head and arrayed him in vestures of fine linen and put a gold chain about his neck. And he made him to ride in the second chariot which he had. That's better than vice president. Amen. And they cried before him, bow the knee. And he made him ruler over all the land of Egypt. And Pharaoh said unto Joseph, I am Pharaoh. And without thee shall no man lift his hand or foot in all the land of Egypt. And Pharaoh called Joseph's name, Zafnath Pa'ania. And he, that's pretty good, isn't it? And he gave him to wife Azanath, the daughter of Potiphar, the priest of On. And Joseph went out all over the, all the land of Egypt. God, and now, there's a question in the minds of the scholars what Zafnath Pa'ania means. Some say it means one in whom the secrets are given. Some say that it means uh, like the savior of the world. And then there's an obscure guy that says he owns a red Subaru. That's what that means. That would be me that says that. But see, Zafna Pa'ania, he owns a red Subaru. But I, what I like about this is the name that he was given was an Egyptian name. And it probably meant the man in whom the Spirit of God is. When God gives you a new name, He puts a new spirit in you. He does not listen to me. That old spirit that you had was a devil. And that old spirit was the reason why you did what you did. But now you've got a new spirit in you. And all of a sudden now, you don't want to do that stuff anymore. Raise your hand if that's you. Raise your hand. All the stuff that you used to do, you got saved. God gave you a new spirit. All of a sudden you're just going... Beer doesn't taste the same. Cigarettes stink. Amen? Curse words taste like soap. Or whatever. They just don't, they just don't, you don't get it anymore. Amen? Zafnath Padnea. Acts chapter 13. Turn there. Acts chapter 13. These this guys with a new name. Verse 6. When they had gone through the island of Paphos, they found a certain sorcerer, a false prophet, a Jew, whose name was Bar-Jesus, which was with the deputy of the country, Sergius Paulus, a prudent man, who called for Barnabas and Saul. Who is that? Saul. And desired to hear the word of God. But Elimus, the sorcerer, for so is his name in, by interpretation, withstood them, seeking to turn away the deputy from the faith. Then Saul, who is also called Paul. Now you're looking at the place in the Bible where it changed. Acts chapter 13, it changes right here. After this, you don't see it no more. Saul, let's, let me read this. He's filled with the Holy Ghost, set his eyes on him, and he said, O full of all subtlety and all mischief, thou child of the devil, thou enemy of all righteousness, wilt thou not cease to pervert the right ways of the Lord? I want to tell you, if there was anybody who knew about see, uh, perverting the right ways of the Lord, it was Saul of Tarsus. If there was anybody who was an enemy of all things righteous, it was Saul of Tarsus. If there was anybody who was full of devils, it was Saul of Tarsus. He knew this. He knew all about it. And he said, Now behold, the hand of the Lord is upon thee, verse 11, and thou shalt be blind, not seeing the sun for a season. Immediately there fell on him a mist and a darkness. And he went about seeking some to lead him by the hand. Then the deputy, when he saw what was done, believed, being astonished at the doctrine of the Lord. Now when Paul and his company loosed from Paphos, they came to Perga and Pamphylia, and John departing from them, returned to Jerusalem. So what you see now is a changeover from Saul to Paul. Saul used to believe that by pretending to keep the law, you please God. And that's not how it is anymore. We don't keep the Saul thought that way. Paul doesn't. 
Paul says, can't keep the law. It is by grace we are saved, through faith, and that not of ourselves. It is a gift of God. That's what Paul says. Saul never said that. Saul used to kill Christians. Paul made Christians. Saul hated Jesus. Paul died for Jesus. Will you die for God? With that new name? That's what that new name means. It means you lay your neck on the line for the Lord. It means you understand that this life is nothing, but the life of head is everything. That's the difference between Saul and Paul. So Saul was all about dressing up the outside. Paul was about cleaning up the inside. Amen. Now, I'm almost done. Revelation 2, 17. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. Look at this in your Bible now. To him that overcometh. To him that overcometh. Where are you right now? As far as things in life goes. Are you under something? Under stress? Under sin? Under devil's oppression? Lynn, you testified that, but you have overcome. Isn't it something that they'll leave you alone every morning until Sunday morning? And then they'll beat on you. They'll beat you silly Sunday morning. They'll try every trick in the book to get you. From, Emily, God bless. You're going to have major surgery tomorrow. What are you doing here? What are you, crazy? I'd be going home. They tell you, don't eat nothing after midnight. I'd eat everything until midnight. <laughs> she decided that being in God's house, best place for her. Okay? Before the surgeon's hand touches her, the hand of the Lord would be laid upon her. Okay? To him that overcometh will I give to eat of the hidden manna, and will give him a white stone, and in the stone a new name written, which no man knoweth, saving he that receiveth it. That's where I got the idea that everybody's name is going to be different. You are, listen, God saves the world, but He loves you. You are unique to God. You are uniquely special to God. You personally have your own salvation worked out with fear and trembling with God. He loves this church, but He loves you in it. He's going to give you your own special name that nobody else has. Wow. Revelation 3.12 Him that overcometh will I make a pillar in the temple of my God and he shall go no more out and I will write upon him the name of my God and the name of the city of my God which is New Jerusalem which cometh down out of heaven from my God and I will write upon him watch this Watch, Jesus said, I will write upon him my new name. Even Jesus is getting a new name. Do you know what it is? Nobody does. Turn to Revelation 19. Turn to Revela this is the last passage of, in the sermon. So turn there. I'm going to cut you loose here in a minute. Boy, and this, and this been good. I, I, I listen, I, I fell on this and Man, I, I was blessed studying this out. I kept thinking, who else? I, I wanted to make it big. Who else got a new name? Who else got a different name? Um, boy, I, and I just sat thinking. I would have added, I don't know how many other people in the Bible got a new name, but if I would have figured it out last night, you'd have been here till two. <laughs> Revelation nineteen eleven. I saw heaven open. Behold, a white horse. He that sat upon him was called faithful and true. Aren't you glad Jesus, you can call Jesus faithful? Aren't you glad you call him true? You know what that means? His word is true. Everything he says is true. And in righteousness he that judge and make war. His eyes were as a flame of fire and on his head were many crowns. 
He had a name, watch this, he had a name written that no man knew but he himself. And if you go back to Revelation 3.12, I will write upon him my new name. See, we are identified as Christians named after Jesus Christ here on this earth. We are identified as Christians. But in New Jerusalem, we are going to be identified with the new name that Jesus has that nobody knows, but he's going to write upon us his new name. So, that, watch this. So that when God calls the new name, all of us come because all of us are going to be named by that name. When God sees us, He is looking at His only begotten Son. He had a new name written that no man knew but He Himself, and He was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood. Watch this, and His name is called the Word of God. One year down in Harrison, Arkansas, Lonnie Burks told me, he said, Mike, he said, I see a maturity in you that I've not seen before. And I was not offended that he said that. I said, Lonnie, that is probably about the greatest thing anybody's ever said to me. Thank you for that. And now when he introduces me, he introduces me as the Bible man. The Word of God. Does people know about you that you're a Bible person? She's got superpowers. She's Bible girl. Do they know that about you? Would people call you that? I don't mind being known as the Bible guy. That don't bother me a bit in the world. That's the name of Jesus. Amen. And the armies which are in heaven followed him upon white horses, clothed in fine linen, white and clean. Out of his mouth goeth the sharp sword, that with it he should smite the nations. He shall rule them with a rod of iron. He treadeth the winepress and the fierceness and the wrath of Almighty God, and hath on his vesture and on his thigh name written. And here's another name of his, seven words, King of kings and Lord of lords. Now, I wouldn't mind him writing that on me either. Not that I'm the king. But I serve the king. Kanye West. Rapper. Cursed in the Oval Office. Drew much hated attention. Because he wanted to go see the president of the United States and say to him, will you listen to me and I wouldn't mind working with you to make America great. He even wore the hat. Now, his own people may not like him. I don't like his music. But I like what he did. He wasn't afraid to sit down with the man of this country and say, hear me out. And I want to work with you to make my people better. We don't serve necessarily the president, but we serve the king of kings and lord of lords. And I don't mind people knowing that that's who I work with and work for. Even though I'm hated, it doesn't bother me because I serve the king of kings and lord of lords. I want you to bow your head. The altar's here. If you want to use it. If you want to come and pray. But think about your name. Because your name is your reputation. It's your identity. It's who you are. You created that identity. You did. So do people know you for the sins you committed, 
or do they know you for the God who you serve? Whose name do they know you by? So if you're here or you're listening online, I want you to listen for a minute. If people still know you by the old name and they know you by the sins that you committed or the ways that you acted that were not right, if that's when your name comes up, if that's how they know you, God can change that. God can. You can't. You cannot change it. But God can. He can give you a new name. But he'll give you a new heart with it. The two go together. You don't get the second chance without getting a second heart. And a second life. And a second spirit. You don't get that without being changed. So if you're here, you're, you're listening to me. And your heart's not right. And your name's not right. You can get a new name. You can get a new heart. But this morning, I just want you to, if, if God's blessed you and given you a new life, I want you to tell Him thank you. If you're here this morning and you've been a little hesitant about letting other people know who you really are now, ask God to help you turn loose. If the devil knows you because he knows he can get to you quickly, or does the devil know you like he knows Jesus and Paul and he's scared of you? Is that how it is? Father, come before you today, and Lord, I pray for each and every one that's here, each and every one that's listening to me this morning. Father, everyone has a need, and all the needs are different. So, Father, I'm just going to pray, Lord, that you have your way in every heart and every need. And Lord, if there is somebody, God, who doesn't have a new name, and God, I pray, Lord, that you'd find them, that you'd give it to them. You can do it, God. God, if there's somebody here, Lord, that they've just been, just they've, they've held back. They've got a new name. They serve you. They, they're like Gideon. They do it at night because they're afraid of making people mad. But God, the God that we serve is the only true God. And people are going to get mad just because of that. But Father, just work in hearts. You deal with lives. Lord, you speak to people the way you, that only you can do. And we'll give you the praise and the thanks for it in Jesus' name. And all of God's people said, Amen. Amen. Would you stand to your feet? Appreciate you coming today. It's been good to be in God's house. Amen.